Hello everyone! Welcome to another Purposeful Conversations with me, Emmy, here in the Pame Code Facebook community. And, you know, after several weeks of lockdown, we can now see, you know, different parts of the world starting to ease the, the lockdown a little bit. I mean, here in the UK, you know, the, the children went back to school um, last week. You know, some shops have started to open. And I know that in, in some parts of the world, you know, the, the easing of the lockdown is, is starting to happen. And while this is going Going on, I think it's still really quite important for us to 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 boost our immunity. You know, the, the coronavirus is still there, but you know, we still you know we still need to to boost our immunity. And I invited our um, guest for today to talk about cooking and and what we can do to use cooking. You know, use food to actually improve our immune system and, and be healthy, you know, especially in this day and age. So without further ado, let's all welcome food and lifestyle blogger, Stephanie Medley. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Can you Hi. hear me? Hi. Hi. Yes. I'm good. I'm I good. <laughs> I think um, there's a little yeah, bit of a lag. I, I'm so sorry if, it, you know, it might be my internet, but it's so wonderful to, to have you today. And, you know, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. I am too. I can't wait to dive on in and talk a little bit. Awesome. Well, you know, before anything, I mean, for those people who haven't heard of you before or haven't seen your blog before, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, what's your blog about and what's your mission? Like, why did you have this blog in the first place? Sure. So, I mean, you know, my blog has been a, a little something in the back of my mind for a few years now. And um, I've kind of been putting it off and putting it off. And I finally decided this year I'm going to go ahead and launch it. And I've been working on it um, since 2019, like heavily on it and launched it in February of this year. And so it's really my creative outlet. Um, I love to cook. I actually went to culinary school um, before I finished my undergrad and just kind of have had cooking in my life since I can remember. And so I wanted to be able to share that with people. Um, I want to be able to tell stories about food to people and share my food journey. And so I also have interviews on the blog and talk with chefs and home cooks and elders and other creative creatives and tastemakers about their food journeys and their just their creative process. And um, really about how we're all connected through food mm. and how food brings people together. And so that's really what my goal is with the blog is to tell other folks stories, share some good food and talk about how food brings us together. Oh, that's wonderful. And I can actually sense how passionate you are about food. And, and it's not just about the food, as you've said, you know, there's this, you know, it does bring people together, you know, it, I, I know when, when I'm around foodies, you know, it lights them up and it gives yeah. them so much joy and so much pleasure to be actually giving a piece of, you know, of, of their heart, really. You know, they, they show a lot of care when they cook and when they are able to, um, you know, to share this with other people, you know, it, it, it brings them so much joy. Um, so when it comes to your blog, you know, all these stories that you have, uh, you know, food stories about uh, in your blog, what sort of stories are there? You know, what, what, you know, what are you sharing there? Yeah, so, you know, it's everything. And I will say, you know, because we're in this pandemic right now, um, <laughs> Some of the interviews that I had lined up for the blog ended up getting paused. And so um, this has also been a way for me to find other ways to share folks stories. But on the blog right now, I have stories from um, young entrepreneurs, like for instance, they're called the Vegan Hood Chefs. Um, and they run a pop-up in the San Francisco area. And they're just amazing. And they also have a social justice lens. So it's not just about cooking for them. It's about how are they creating healthy spaces within the community. Um, I've talked to folks that are doing events around storytelling and food. And so combining um, different entrepreneur stories with the food that they're making and then bringing um, 
folks from across the Bay Area into those spaces to talk about that food and to talk about what it's like to be an entrepreneur. So those are some of the stories that I have. Um, I'll be actually cooking with, and you know, that's one thing that I try to do too. The folks that I interview, um, I try to cook with them also, mm. because I think that can also bring a different type of togetherness and you just get to know people in a different way. And so one of the things how I've had to pivot um, in this time is thinking about how I use Instagram live. And so since mm -hmm. I haven't been able to see people in person, I've been doing Instagram lives with folks where I interview them and we actually cook together on the Instagram live. And so it's called Breaking Bread Live. And that's been a way, you know, to really break bread together, even though we can't physically be in the same space together. Mm -hmm. And also invite other people into that space to ask questions and I provide a grocery list beforehand. So if folks want to buy prepare. it, yes. yeah, they can prepare right along with us. I love it. Well, that's why I connected with you. You know, there's something about your vibe that is so purposeful. You know, our community is called Living with Purpose. And it is a community that are, you know, of people who are purpose driven. And your blog, yeah, as you've said, it's not just about the food. You know, there's something about um community. It's about, you know, connection. And it's about, yeah, yeah, making those connections with other people, telling stories. And it's just so wonderful. And um, in case, uh, you know, for those who don't know what PAME stands for, you know, the, the Living with Purpose group actually comes from the word PAME. It's a Greek word that means let's go together. And, you know, with, with your food blog, it's really, you know, that there's something about, you know, being together, you know, people making these connections, you know, sharing our joys, sharing our stories, and in this case, sharing food, you know, because yeah. food is a, is a fantastic um, connector. And, and there are a lot of stories around food as well. You get to know, um, you know, people's um, personal backgrounds, their cultures, their traditions, and, you know, food is a, you know, it's a great way to, yeah, to bring people together. But um, we'll talk about the community aspects and the social justice aspects of your work a little bit later but um, I know that the, the people who are watching now are expecting us to talk about you know immunity like how, how to how to boost your immunity so let's try to cover that um, for now um, when it comes to cooking and when it comes to boosting your immunity through food you know what sort of um, things can we do to prepare our food or what sort of um, ingredients um, will help us to, to boost our immunity in, 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 uh, at, at this time? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I noticed um, kind of when we went into this pandemic, when I went grocery shopping, you know, people, there was a panic that set in, right? Um, because folks didn't really know what was going on. Um, and there was kind of this rush to buy non-perishable foods, which I completely understand. Uh, but then I looked and all of the veggies and things were still there. Mm. And so, you know, that's one of the things that um, I was like, wow, you know, people are just not buying vegetables right now. And that's in, uh, in my area in the Bay Area. They're buying but, canned goods and... Yeah, yeah, canned goods and dried goods and things. And nothing's wrong with those, those things. But, you know, it's how do you um, combine those things with other fresh ingredients, right? And, and so that's one of the big things. And also one of the things that I try to share... Um, on my social network. So one of the things that I, I do, I do a section called What's the Tea? And mm -hmm. it's all about teas that can help boost your immunity, right? And so a lot of things that we may have around the house, like we may have ginger around the house and you can drink ginger as a tea or you can cook with it. Mm -hmm. And it promotes healthy digestion. It's an antioxidant or... You know, we may have some turmeric. I do a turmeric and ginger tea. And both of those together, they're both anti-inflammatory. They're both good for your health. And so those are some of the things that promote, um, that boost your immune system. And so some of those things, it's like, how do we um, utilize some of the things that we may even go to a grocery store and like, yeah, I don't really know what this is. <laughs> you see the ginger is like, what? what's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I know a lot of folks 
um, root vegetables kind of get a bad rap. And mm. so I did a whole series on root vegetables just to try to introduce people to beets. I know for a long time, I wouldn't eat beets. Because I was like, yeah. <laughs> what is that? What do you do with that? <laughs> exactly. And so it's it's about introducing folks to um, foods that are just generally healthy for you, and you can eat them different ways. Mm. So even when we're thinking about citrus, so we know citrus is good. It has vitamin C, and it can boost your immunity. But it's thinking about different ways that you can get vitamin C into your system as well, right? So it's not just citrus fruits. Um, you can get vitamin C in different peppers, um, yellow peppers, red bell peppers. Um, and you add them in your, in your food. So it's not, just exactly. the, it's not just the citrus fruits. It's not just eating it as a fruit, but you can actually use these ingredients in right. your cooking. Exactly, exactly. You can even get it from some herbs. Like thyme has vitamin C in it parsley has vitamin c in it and when you look at different greens and cruciferous vegetables so like broccolis and kales and spinach and so all of those things it's not like oh well i can only eat this one thing and i'm gonna get just one nutrient mm -hmm. all of these things they have multiple multiple um nutrients and 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 things within them and when you put them all together, you can make some really good stuff. The variety and the different colors, right? I, I don't cook. Um, well, I can boil an egg. <laughs> <laughs> I can cook rice. You know, I have a rice cooker and I can cook. But basically, the, the cook in this house, the chef in this house is actually my husband. And he's originally from Greece. And mm. Mediterranean cooking is just absolutely fantastic. It is so it colorful. Is. It is it's so full of herbs and spices. And the color on the plate it's it's just you have the reds the oranges the yellows uh, the greens you know it's um it's it's wonderful um to 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 see it, it just even to see the food it's actually quite beautiful um so for those who aren't really like for example myself i'm not really comfortable in the kitchen you know i don't have this you know culinary skills you know where do we start how do we start um eating healthy you know and, and particularly to boost our immune system even if we don't really have the the you know the skills in in the kitchen yeah i mean it's super easy i think that cooking should be fun <laughs> and i think it should be simple um even though you know i've spent hours in the kitchen i if i can spend the least amount of time in the kitchen i will um and if i can make everything in just one pot I will. And, you know, that's a really good way to start um, kind of experimenting a little bit with cooking is making like one pot meals. Mm. Um, two of the things that I think are really easy to, to make um, and you can just throw in whatever you want because, you know, really cooking is about, it's an art and it's about mm. being kind of free, right? You don't want to be too rigid. Um, with recipes, but kind of be free with it. Have the freedom to test it and see how exactly. it goes. You know what? Yeah. Th that's what I love about, you know, foodies. When I watch them cook, you know, they, they're so happy. <laughs> you know, that there's joy in experiment, especially, for example, my, my mother-in-law. You know, you can sense the joy and the love that whenever she cooks, she's smiling and she's, she can't wait to actually serve you know, what, what she's um, cooking because it gives her so much pleasure to be mixing and testing and, and see yeah. how it goes. And, you know, if you ask for the um, recipe for her, she's not going to give you the, the um, specific measurements because, you know, just, just throw it there and, and see and taste <laughs> it. You, you know what I mean? So yeah, you can see the pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the fun in them and, and the pleasure. And I love watching foodies for, for that reason because I can see the joy um, when they're actually um, cooking the food. And, you know, and that's one thing. So, you know, say for instance, you went out and you got some canned goods. I love chickpeas and lentils. Mm. So let's just take chickpeas, for instance, oh, right? Oh, same here. I love chickpeas. <laughs> yeah. 
and they're full of fiber, full of protein. I mean, they're good. Um, even if you have high blood sugar, these can help lower that glycemic index. So check chickpeas are your friend. Um, but let's just take that for instance. And there's different ways you can play around with chickpeas. Um, me, my family is mainly from the southern part of America. Um, so Louisiana, Tennessee. And so there, we call it the Holy Trinity. Onion, bell peppers, celery. A mm. lot of my cooking has those three things in it. And they're really aromatics. Um, whether you're cooking with a little bit of butter or some olive oil or some grapeseed oil, um, like saute up some of those vegetables, or you could do a mirepoix, which is onion, carrot, and celery, depending on what you like. Um, throw in a couple of spices that you like. I tend to lean towards um, thyme, paprika, those are some of my favorites, basil and some salt and pepper, mm. maybe throw in some tomatoes. If you have some canned tomatoes or fresh tomatoes, let it simmer for a bit and you're going to have something really good. And depending mm. on what flavors and things you put in there, it can taste more Mediterranean. It can have more of a Southern flair to it. Um, if you're adding things like cumin or coriander, it may have more, um, like a like Mexican or Puerto Rican or you know just uh, uh, add all those flavors in yeah. and you could you could so, test it and yeah you can do so many different things and yeah. you can just about do that with any bean so even if you don't like chickpeas try it with another bean like, <laughs> <laughs> and you know yeah. just mix and match the flavors and well the thing is you you have that confidence to to just keep trying i i remember when i when i did my research you know because i i've mentioned you know off of the record you know before before we started recording this conversation i'm a community and health psychologist um you know uh, as, as a profession and i've done some research in the community um with you know south asian boys who have diabetes and for them they actually don't know how to cook um, because their mom does it for them or their wives do it for them um, but they need to um, if, if you're going to encourage them to cook they want to keep it as simple as possible and they would say if you can just limit it to three ingredients three ingredients tops please no more you know because they when they see you know, so many ingredients on the on the recipe, they feel intimidated. So, you know, you just start off with just salt, pepper, and your main ingredient, you know, just to see how it goes. And then and then you can start experimenting and, and you yeah. know testing it out. You know, once you start building the confidence to actually um cook the food yourself. Exactly. Exactly. I yeah. mean that's a really good salt and pepper can go a very long way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well. just to start off. And I have to say, you know, for me, because I, I told you earlier, I, I actually didn't know how to cook because we, you know, our, our grandmother, um, she did all the cooking. And, you know, whenever I tried to come into the kitchen and say, you know, can I, can I have a go? It's like, no, this is my kitchen. I'm going to deal with the cooking. Just, you know, go. So for me, before I met my husband, the way that I fed myself is I have a rice cooker. I will cook my brown rice. I will grill some meats on the, you know, on the grill. Um, I'll have my steamed vegetables on top of my rice cooker. And that's it, really. You know, I, you know that's how I survived. You know, it's very um, minimal for me. Steamed veg, a bit of brown rice, and grilled meat. And mm -hmm. when I when I met him, like you were talking about chickpeas, like the, the different things that he does with the chickpeas. <laughs> we have chickpea korma, we have hummus, we have he, he even makes them like um like fried chickpea balls or something like yeah, that. They're just yeah. absolutely delicious. But um They're so versatile, like yeah. they really are. Yeah, but yeah, I mean you know, building the confidence in the kitchen, it does take, you know, a bit of time, you know, and, and as I've said earlier, you know, the, the joy of cooking. I, I love watching foodies when they cook. And have you, did you start at an early age, you know, this thing about you and, and cooking and food? Is, is this, you know, something that you, you remember since you were a, a child? Uh, yeah. Um, so my granny is the one that taught me how to cook. 
Um, and I was, for a while, we lived right next door to my mm -hmm. granny and gramps. Um, so I, I was with her all the time. That's who took care of me um, when my mom went back to work. I think maybe about four or six months old is when my mom went back to work. And from that point on, I was with my granny. Um, so uh, she's the one that really kind of sparked an interest in cooking for me. She was like the ultimate hostess. Um, mm. She was known for like her dinner parties and and just hosting people and, and baking. And so I really just kind of took that on. And she was very particular, like, you set up a table this way and this mm. is how you present food. And, you know, it's always been about food should be good, but it should also look pretty. So even going back to yeah. when you were you, you present colors, it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, how does your food look as well? And so that just kind of always stuck with me. And um, I just kind of became like the little cook in the family. So even some of the recipes that she was known for, um, she's passed away now, but it kind of fell on me yeah. to cook those things. And but so this that is the thing that you were saying, you know, the food, it connects e even with the, you know, the different generations that even after you've passed on, you're, you're leaving the legacy through food. Yeah. And, you know, even in my journey of starting the blog, so she didn't write everything down. Um, so a lot of what I have from her cooking is completely by memory um, and her just teaching me one-on-one -on -one about how to cook things. But she did have some recipes um, written down. And so that was one of the things that I wanted when she passed away is just to have her, her recipe box. And um, it's been amazing when I was preparing to launch and everything, just going through the recipe box and um seeing just everything that was in the recipe box because it wasn't just recipes um she had old newspaper clippings from like the 30s and the 40s and the mm -hmm. 50s and the 60s and um it was just kind of amazing you can Some see of a bit of history it's like a time yeah. capsule right it was and i was just like sometimes i was like crying and so <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I was laughing, um, but just to even see from different cutouts of recipes from, you know, like a women's journal or something that she may have gotten it from, kind of, kind of seeing the evolution of um, how we cook food as well is interesting. Wow. Well, I mean, if, if people would like to read your blog and, and visit your blog, what, what is it called and wh where can they find it? Yeah, so my blog is called Savor and Sage, S-A-V-O-R and Sage, S-A-G-E. And it's a little play on words mm. <laughs> um, because savoring as far as the food aspect um, and sage, you know, you can cook with sage, but it also means wisdom. And I also feel that we need to savor life. And so that's why I want to call the blog Savor and Sage. Um, but you can find Savor and Sage at savorandsage.com. I'm also on Instagram at Saber and Sage and on Facebook at Saber and Sage. That's wonderful. And yeah, before we started recording you, we were talking about the community and social justice aspects um, of your work as well. I mean, what um, what does your blog contribute um, in terms of the community engagement and, and, and social cohesion, you know, especially in, in, in what we are experiencing right now? Yeah, you know, um, I never, well, you know, I think in everything that I do, there's going to be some social justice aspect to it. I mean, that's what I do for my day job as well. But even in this, um, there's a social justice lens when, especially when I'm looking and interviewing people. And so um, I do have a heavy focus. I interview anybody, um, but I do have a heavy focus on people of color and um, even more specifically, um, Black people across the diaspora. And because I think, you know, folks of color, there are, we have so many stories and such a rich, rich history, um, but a lot of times those stories don't get told um, or they're told um, in a negative light. Mm. And so, you know, one of my goals is to 
kind of look at those stories, change the narrative on those stories, or just shed light on stories that aren't being told. Um, and also thinking about just food justice. What are those different food ways that we have where there are inequities or disparities? And, um, you know, I figured through my blog is just a little way that I can contribute <laughs> to yeah. some. I mean, you're you're putting it. Uh, you you have that that space, you know, to to have these conversations, to have these voices heard, to have these stories told. Because if that space didn't, uh, you know, if you didn't have that space, where would the conversations, you know, where where are we going to talk about these things? And when you talked about um, food injustice and food inequalities, what does that exactly mean? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so when I'm when I'm thinking about that and when I'm talking about that, really focusing on, for instance, in the Bay Area, you know, we have some community where there are food deserts, um, meaning that some of those communities don't have um, grocery stores that are nearby. Um, or they only have like liquor stores and things like that. So the access to healthy food, um, it's very limited. And, you know, some folks don't have the means to travel um, a, certain, a certain distance to get those fresh foods. And so what's popping up, and I'm sure folks have heard of like urban gardening and things like that. And so you know, folks are coming in and figuring out, okay, well, how do we create community gardens so people do have access to fresh food right and wow. those are some of the things that you know those are the stories that I'm interested in telling um and not even just in the Bay Area I, I've started branching out even though I, I may not be able to get there physically but even people that are in other other states or other countries reaching out to them so I can hear what their stories are um because you know it's it's important. Food, yeah. we need food to live. And so when you have like groups of people that don't have access to healthy foods or only have access to foods that aren't the best for them, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. It actually kind of reminds me of the, some of the research that I've done in the, you know, in the pockets of, of London, you know, disadvantaged communities in London and here where I am now, you know, in, in, in Stoke on Trent, you know, it's a relatively um, deprived area in England. And when we do a mapping exercise, for example, you can see where there are pockets of, you know, um, you know, communities where, as you've said, they have no access to, to healthy food. You will We'll see uh, a, a, an entire road just filled with um, fast food and um, really unhealthy food, and you know access to healthy food is is quite difficult. And and in in, in some of the community engagement events that I've been to, you know, when we talk to um, people on the ground and ask them about healthy eating, they would always say something like, "At uh, first, they don't have access um, to healthy food." That they can't afford uh, for some reason, you know, to to um, eat organic. You know, for them, healthy eating is equal to organic equals it's it's expensive, without realizing that they can actually grow their own, um, you know, uh, vegetables. You know, if they have the space. But then again, they would say, "We haven't got the space. We haven't got." You know, they live in flats. You know, I think in the states you call them like apartment blocks or or something like that so so they haven't got that space so there are barriers to healthy eating um and when you are able to identify those barriers in the community whether it is accessibility whether it is the um you know some social constraints you know when you have these constraints in in food and healthy eating then we'll need to find ways to um you know, to create opportunities for them to, to eat more healthily at a more structural and, you know, at a more social level because it doesn't really always boil down to individual responsibility. Yeah, no, not at all. You know, I think a lot of times we we'll try to put things on behavior, right, of folks, on individual behavior. Oh, well, you need to change this individual behavior um, in order for things to happen when we have like this institutional trauma <laughs> and that's the the reason why people are mm. suffering the way they're suffering and so yeah how do we change it 
systemically? How that's do we right. change that structural racism and trauma that's happening? Yeah, looking at it from a more, yeah, on a more structural, on a more institutional level rather than just, you know, pinning down on, on individual behavior. And I have to say for, you know, for, for my field as, as a health psychologist, you know, we've been criticized for focusing so much on, on individual health behaviors. Ah, you're fat because you eat too much, you know, junk food and you eat too much fat right. and, and so on without really recognizing that, yeah, there are barriers to healthy eating, that there are social, economic, and environmental factors that impact on these individual behaviors, you know, access to healthy food, access to outdoor space, you know, for, for exercise, you know, for physical activity. I, you know, I've been involved in um you know health promotion projects for example where they you know they they bring the community together as you've said you know you cook together where you have allotments where people will actually attend the garden together you know these are community based projects that actually need to be supported you know and and this this is a, a you know a structure this is a more social you know community project rather than just pinning down on on individual you know, individual behavior. And I yeah. think what you are doing with your blog, you know, you know, bringing people together through food and talking about food, talking about their stories, the history of the food. I mean, it's just wonderful. And I, you know, you are really making the contributions, uh, you know, when we talk about inequalities and social justice and so on, your, your take on it through a food point of view, I think is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. I, you know, I was so, um, before I even started, I was like, you know, will people want to listen to what I have to say? Because <laughs> I do have <laughs> something to say. Um, and so I was like, you know, even if it's just one person um, that enjoys my blog, I'm like so down with that and <laughs> appreciate that so much because, um, there's so much richness, I think, that I think there's so much richness in my story, but like other people's stories and other people's foods. And, you know, I think even the time that we're in right now within the, in the, in the United States, you know, there's so much tension and grief happening. And it's like, it's heartbreaking. And so really look, looking and listening at people and it's because people don't feel seen. And so when you really kind of take a step back and start, start um, respecting and listening to the hurt people are feeling, I think that's, it's so important. And then actually taking action, right? Um, because all of this is connected. The food is connected. The politics are connected. Um, the healthcare is connected. What's happening in the criminal legal system is connected. The education is connected. It's all connected. And the truth is, there's a lot of disparities across those different things. And so we have to come together in order to change it. That's and wonderful. transform it. It's uh, it, it's good to have this conversation. Actually, you know, we we started off with you know, okay, we're gonna have this conversation about cooking and boosting your immunity, and and it's actually quite refreshing to to talk about this. Uh, you know, to talk about food for from a you know a social inequality and justice perspective. Um, you know, some people might not even see the connection, but as you've said, you know, everything is connected, the food, the, the social, economic, um, demographic, cultural, health, political, you know, just, you know, these are all connected and it's good to have this conversation to try to piece together where are these connections and with yeah. your blog, you know, just to have that platform to have the stories told, to have those voices heard. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And I would encourage you to please, please continue. And, and please, you know, keep going with those interviews and, you know, keep talking Thank to people and, and spread your, your blog as widely as you can. So, you know, those, those messages, you know, those stories can be heard. Thank you so much. I appreciate this so much.
Wonderful. Well, Stephanie, I will leave the um, link to your blog in the description. So for those people who want to visit um, Stephanie's blog, you can visit it at saverandsage.com. That's correct. Cor yeah, is that correct, Stephanie? Yes, saverandsage.com. You will see uh, the interviews there, the blog, the recipes. Um, and you know, if you need to connect with Stephanie, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, if you'd like to, I like to hear from people. So if you would like to send me an email, you can email me at saverandsage at gmail.com. Um, or you can send me a message if you start following me on Instagram or Facebook. You can send me a message that way as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for sharing your stories and, and your passion as well, Stephanie, with us here in the PAMI Code Facebook community. And I hope to those of you who are, are watching us um, today, I hope that you found some insight in, in this conversation. I know that we started off the conversation, you know, talking about, you know, cooking and immunity and so on. But you know, it, with what's happening in the world right now, you can see that food is actually connected in so many other, you know, aspects in our lives. And, and I hope that this conversation helped you to, to connect the pieces that actually food is connected to our stories, to our social, um, economic, you know, cultural backgrounds, our history, our politics, you know, the social justice system and so on. It's all interconnected. And I hope that this conversation uh, helped you to see all the links together and, and continue to connect the conversation as well and pass it on to others so thanks stephanie thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll catch up again next time for another purposeful conversations with me and me here in the pami code facebook group until then take care everyone and bye for now bye 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 <laughs>